Hi, welcome to Fiber Chats. My name is Irina, I'm the host here. And my guest today is John Raffersberger, right? That's the right, the right name. That's I'm correct. Practicing. I was practicing, <laughs> as you can tell. <laughs> so most people know you as a quilting doctor. And in reality, you're in the medical profession. So was how did this name came to be? Yeah, so I am, you're correct, I'm in the medical profession. I'm a doctor of nursing practice. So I'm a doctorally prepared nurse practitioner and a primary care provider. Um, so the, the name just kind of uh, came from that. I've been quilting for about four years. So um, I kind of just combined those two worlds and uh, quilting doctor just came to be um, nothing more to it than that other than being in the medical profession and, and having the doctorate. So when you started knitting you didn't have this idea that you're gonna take quilts from other people and bring them back to life and sort of doctor them right? It was no no <laughs> yeah and there are other um, you know businesses out there that uh, you know kind of use the name doctor as like quilt doctor um, but for me, it's more of I'm a quilter, I'm a doctor, and, and those two things came together. Right. So what brought you to quilting? Like, why did you decide to start quilting? Sure. So um, I grew up with quilts being a big part of my life because of my grandmother, um, my uh, maternal grandmother. Um, she would make us quilts as gifts. Um, her house was full of wall hangings of quilts that she had made. And her work was just stunning, and, and it was always a big part of our lives uh, throughout our childhoods. Um, about five years ago, my grandmother passed away, um, and there are no other quilters in the family. So a few months after her death, um, I kind of realized that nobody was going to be continuing on that legacy of being able to give gifts um, and quilts. Uh, so I, I flew down to Florida where I had a friend I knew who was a quilter and, and spent two weeks with her and, and she taught me to quilt. Um, and then I was able to the following Christmas make my mother a quilt. Um, it was a, a big king size quilt for her bed that had cardinals all over it because my um, grandmother's favorite bird was a cardinal. So um, that was kind of the intention to learn how to quilt so I could make that gift for my mother. And then I just realized how much I loved it and it's just kind of blown up from there. Unfortunately, I didn't get uh, to save all of my grandmother's supplies. She had uh, just a room full of fabrics and machines and amazing quilting stuff. And at the time of her passing, when we were uh, uh, packing up all the things from her home, um, I didn't realize I was going to get into quilting. So we did get them all to people who would quilt and make things with them. Um, but I do have some of her quilts still. So fortunately, I have some of her work, just not all of the things she used to make them. So when she was doing quilts, were those like traditional quilts that you usually see? Or was she like very imaginative in her quilting techniques? She did a little bit of both. So she would do some kind of traditional quilting methods that you very common see or traditional quilting blocks. But then she also did a lot of kind of the, the holiday, more modern decorative stuff you see with uh, hand applique images sewn on to quilts. And so the things that she would make for wall hangings and decorative stuff were a little more modern and decorative, but she also had um, kind of a uh, traditional quilting style, which I think I've kind of picked up on too. I, I combined the, the traditional motifs that you see that have always been there throughout quilting with some uh, more modern um, paper piecing and, and modern designs. So a, a little bit of both that she did. And, and I think I kind of continued that same trend. I mean, is that like, do you feel like when you're quilting, do you always think of her? Like, do you feel like she surrounds you somehow? I do. It's a, it's definitely a great way to, one, make sure that I don't forget her memory um, and kind of keep her close. Um, I also got a tattoo of the Cardinal as well, that um, the, the same thing, the reasoning for my, my mother's quilt. Um, so I just, yeah, I was, I think after she passed, I was reaching for ways of, of keeping her close. And um, not only does it make me feel that way, but it definitely, my family always reminds me um, when I give a gift as a quilt, um, how, I'm going to start crying, how happy my grandmother would have been to, um, to see that happen. So. Right. 
Um, so if you mentioned her supply room and her equipment, tell me the journey of your supplies. Yeah, definitely. So when I first started quilting, um, it was kind of the bare minimum. I had, I had flown to Florida and, and met a friend or uh, worked with that friend who taught me how to quilt. And so I came home and, you know, I uh, wasn't working at the time. I just graduated with my doctorate degree. So I had loads of student debt, um, was uh, studying to pass my boards, my nursing boards to be able to get my license um, and was kind of quilting in between. So I went to Costco and bought the most uh, economical machine that I could find for a little over a hundred dollars and started making quilts with that. I would uh, go to uh, discount fabric stores where I could get fabric as cheap as possible, um, pick things up at Walmart whenever able, basically whatever thrift stores I could find to get the, the, the best supplies at a price that I could afford. Um, so it started really small and, and that's a great thing about quilting is you don't need a lot of stuff to get started. Um, you can just start with a needle and thread and some fabric and scissors and, and that's all you really need to get started. Um, but it's definitely grown to um, me not even being able to fit it into one single room anymore. Now I have a, um, uh, a long arm quilting machine, which is a 12 foot frame with a giant machine on it for quilting uh, quilts together. I have a very nice uh, Bernina um, or Burnett, I'm sorry, um, domestic sewing machine. So I've definitely, as I as I started working as a nurse practitioner and then had the ability to um, kind of grow those things. Now I have just a couple rooms full of supplies, rulers, threads, equipment, and, and things like that. So it definitely has grown as I have grown as a quilter. But one of the wonderful things is you can kind of go either way. You don't need much or you can have as much as you want. So is that why you're building a new house now? <laughs> <laughs> I wish we could build it a little bit bigger even. <laughs> just in case <laughs> just in case that yeah exactly grows. <laughs> so when you, like I saw this um funny reel that you posted how you just moved to a new place and you weren't sure you want to move and then you went to Joanne's fabric and you understood that you're like in the right place and you're just fine is that really like how you feel when you move to a new place or when you like visit some new place you the any uh, fabric store makes you immediately feel at home yeah, fabric stores are definitely a place where I find comfort and, and interestingly, where I find a lot of friends, um, uh, you, especially smaller quilt shops where you can get to know the owner and things like that and, and have that more local connection. Um, but uh, it definitely makes me comfortable to know that there's a quilting community around. Um, and so I, we moved from Washington State to Maryland now, and you know I, uh, I have my uh, profession, or I had my career in Washington State, had my friends there, and so change is always a little bit difficult, especially when it's all the way across the country. And, and being a military spouse, you know my family is back in Wisconsin, so you don't have that family support around you. You're leaving your friends, so it really is just you know me and my partner and our and our dogs. Um, making it work together as a family. And so um, I wasn't incredibly excited about moving to Maryland to begin with, and uh, to be completely honest, but uh, being able to walk into somewhere and see that, you know, it, it didn't necessarily need to be Joanne's, that happened to be where I was, but when you see that amount of attention towards what you do, um, when you walk into a place and you just know that if there's that much fabric there, there is a community of people here that are purchasing that fabric, right? So there's gonna be quilters, there's gonna be fashion designers, there's gonna be an entire community of people. And it just reassures me with the amount of quilt shops that are around here and, and having businesses like that, that it's gonna be easier to, to find that community, develop those new friendships and, and feel at home again, so. Right. So tell me the first time somebody asked you to fix their quilt when something went <laughs> terribly wrong with the quilt and they ask you, can you fix that? Yeah, so it, it happens quite often with people who have dogs and it mostly happens with children's quilts. So baby quilts and they're generally things that, you know, the it, it is a big thing, not only for the family, but for the child themselves, right? It's their, it's their blankie. 
Um, I'm going to get in trouble for calling a quilt a blanket at any moment. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, you know, their comfort thing. And so I've always enjoyed making baby quilts for that reason, because, you know, it's something that that child is going to carry with them for years and, and really love. Um, and so when something happens to those quilts, it's, it's a terrible experience for the family. So all of the quilts that I've repaired have been um, a lot of other military families that know I quilt, um, which is great because then I have that connection as well. Um, but yeah, it's always the situation where the dog got the quilt because the kid left it on the floor, which is going to happen when kids take these quilts with them everywhere. Um, and then finding a way to fix that is always, uh, you know, a fun, challenging thing to do because the way that quilts are made, um, it's not easy to fix one spot because there's so many layers to a quilt. You would have to basically pull the whole quilt apart, which can take multiple days, hours, weeks, um, unless you do a, a simple patch is what ends up happening uh, most of the time. But it's it's a lot of fun to then to see those quilts go back to the, the family or the child and them to kind of get that joy back. Um, and I always try to add something a little bit special, whether it be a really soft texture in that spot. So that spot of the quilt is, is softer and gets more attention than previous parts of the quilt or um, a new kind of image or fabric that the kid is going to really love. Um, so not only is it fixing it, but it's also making it a little bit more special for them. Have anybody had trouble finding that spot that you fixed? Because I mean, uh, you have this one reel again where you're showing like the this huge hole in the quilt and then you fixed it and then you're like, okay, and can you spot it? And I was like, where? Like it was so big, like there's no way you could fix it like that. The people that you give back find have, they, have a hard time to find it they definitely do um if i do a really good job sometimes it's a little difficult especially matching the fabrics but the that one that you're talking about specifically i remember the the family opened it up and they specifically mentioned that you know when they pulled it out they couldn't really tell where the problem was until you really search for it yeah so mm -hmm. i kind of pride myself in in being able to hide some of those things so it definitely is feedback that i get is that they couldn't even tell there was a hole to begin with so when it comes to your quilting technique like are you a perfectionist like do you have to take apart anything that doesn't look 100% exactly how you wanted it yeah most of the time um sometimes it can depend on what i'm making it for if i'm making a quilt for my dogs which i do often then i'll just let it go because somebody's going to chew a hole in it anyway um the quilts that i'm especially making for myself i tend to be the most picky on because it's going to be in front of me at all times and so if it's something that i'm going to display in my home have on my couch and i'm going to see I'm going to know that mistake is there, then I definitely uh, will tear anything apart until I know it's perfect. Um, if it's a gift for another quilter, same thing, because they are going to spot those mistakes, right? The general public is not going to know little details. So if it's a gift for somebody who's not a quilter, I want to say that I maybe let slip a little bit more, but that's probably not even true. I'm, I'm a pretty big perfectionist with uh, what I send out. <laughs> So there is a huge history, like going long time back of quilting, and there's like all different kinds of quilting techniques and quilting motifs. Do you feel like the longer you do it, the more you learn, the more you know, the more important it becomes? Yeah, I, I feel like the more I learn, the more I learn that I don't know, right? The, I, I think this is, I, I had a history teacher who kind of uh, drilled that into us when we were in high school. If 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 you realize you don't know anything about what you're talking about, you probably know more than most people, right? Um, and I feel like that's how my quilting journey is. The 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 more you get into it, the more, like you said, there's just hundreds of techniques and hundreds of styles. And the more you get into it, the more you realize that there is this giant world out there. And the really cool thing is. Um, and I don't know that the history of quilting is, is very well told, um, to be honest. You know, we hear a lot about um, the quilting during the American Revolution, and you get that kind of American uh, motif in history and quilting. Um, but quilting goes so much 
deeper into that and in things like the LGBT community during the AIDS uh, crisis, um, there was a, a huge, there's a huge history in the LGBT community of, of making quilts to um, comfort those that were uh, living with HIV AIDS. And there was a, a giant quilt that was made to memorialize the deaths of, of, of those individuals. Um, so the more you kind of get into it, the more you see how, like with any art, communities kind of take that art, make it their own and kind of create their own history using that art or their storytelling using that art. And, and uh, a lot of people, not a lot of people realize it, but quilting is uh, often a big part of a, a lot of different communities that we don't traditionally think about quilters being a part of. So let's say a hundred years from now, an archeologist stumbles on one of your quilts. What story will it tell them? Um, I think it'll tell them a little bit about who I was. If uh, you'll look at some of my work, you'll see some anatomy mixed in. So it, it'll tell a little bit about who I was as a person. Um, I think my work will also in the end tell a lot about um, my activism and my support for um, uh, finding a voice for minority communities, specifically in the LGBT community. You'll see a lot of references to um, the LGBT community in my work and um, going forward, I hope to kind of push that even further into um, how can we really represent an inclusive community in the quilting world because the history is there for that inclusive community, um, but our current quilting culture isn't necessarily where it should be with that kind of inclusivity. So that is what I hope that uh, an archeologist would get out of it. It's a little bit about me personally and um, a little bit about my goals with uh, promoting inclusivity. Well, when you come to the fabric store, have you ever had any negative reaction to you being a man in the, in the like predominantly female dominated or like at least that's the perception right that most yeah um think. it that's a that's a, a difficult question because i i want to start off with just making sure there's an understanding that that quilting is traditionally a safe space for women for females right and so I think it's important that as a male, especially a white male with some extensive privilege, going into a space which is traditionally supposed to, has traditionally been a comfort space for females, I want to recognize that just me entering that space is a, coming from a place of privilege and that it may make people uncomfortable, right? Because this is supposed to be their, their comfort zone. So. I want to recognize that up front, but at the same time, you know, as a, a male quilter and as a gay quilter, I've definitely gone into situations where um, I have been made to feel very uncomfortable. Um, and it's generally only at, you know, specific stores with specific people. Um, I have had, um, you know, individuals kind of not want to assist with helping me because of it. I have had, um, often on a regular basis, people assume that I'm shopping for somebody else. Um, so I went in a couple of years ago to buy thimbles and sometimes thimbles obviously are fitted to the size of your finger. And so I was looking for a thimble for me and the, I asked a woman for help and she said, well, what size is her finger? <laughs> and so it's just that automatic assumption that I'm not looking for something for myself, which seems kind of silly and, and nothing, but when that is happens to you every mm -hmm. time you go right. somewhere. Um, and then there's, you know, examples I won't get into of, of just kind of more overt discrimination that have happened. But generally what I do is I find a place that I know is inclusive. Um, in Washington state, I had a, a, a quilt shop um, named Bigfoot Quilts that was incredibly inclusive made me feel special and welcome and comfortable every time I would go in. And so that's where I would go and, and spend all of my money and spend all of my time and, um, and get all of my resources there. So there's always a place that you can find for that comfort, but it definitely is a challenge in the quilting world of respecting the fact that this is a safe space for women, um, but also wanting to kind of forge a, a road for myself and for people like me. Right. What's the craziest kind of material you used in your quilt? 
Um, I don't know, crazy. Um, honestly, I've, like I've kind of, yeah, I don't, I don't know that I've done a lot of too off the wall for materials. I, I pretty much stick to um, uh, quilting cottons uh, for my work. Um, the most recent like thing that I've branched out to is doing more of like real soft backs, like minkies and stuff for backs. But um, that's something I think I'm going to have to challenge myself on is getting into um, more kind of unconventional fabrics because it's been pretty um, thus far. It's been I've been pretty standard in what I've been using material wise. Right. So when you started learning, you mentioned this friend that taught you the basics. How did you learn the rest? Like, were you buying books? Were you on YouTube? Like, did you take classes? How did you learn? Lots of YouTube, definitely lots of YouTube. Um, making friends at my local quilt shop um, so that I can ask questions. And then my friend who taught me to quilt, we actually uh, FaceTime about once a week um, and we quilt together. And so while we're on FaceTime and I run into a problem, I can easily kind of address it with her um, immediate. Um, and then uh, YouTube is just full of resources, almost anything you could possibly want to learn. Um, so people like Mr. Domestic, um, I've spent a ton of time watching all of his videos and, and learning the techniques that he does, um, as well as tons of other uh, creators. Andrew Walters uh, is another specific quilter that I've learned a ton from for actually free motion quilting. I've actually got one of her books right here. Um, so definitely a combination of YouTube videos, um, physical books. But I think if I had to give advice to anybody who wants to become a new quilter, if you can get that person who you can contact and kind of talk things through and ask questions, that has been my best resources because there is no one right way to do things. It's just finding ways that work for you. And oftentimes when you're watching a YouTube video, it's one method that's presented. When you read a book, it's one method that's presented and um, that might not be the right method for you. Um, so it's uh, definitely great to have that that resource to reach out to, but um, definitely look everywhere. There's so many resources out there. Where do you find your inspirations for the next project? Like how do they happen? Um, so sometimes it's uh, just uh, who I want to give the quilt to or the reason that I'm making the quilt, right? So I've recently made some um, baby quilts. And so I'll talk to the mother about, um, things like do they have you know a, a, some sort of spiritual connection or does the the child have a theme that they're going with or a vibe that they want to have in the product um, or images that they think uh, relate to that person so um, sometimes I'll just go off of that and I'll design something myself a lot of times it's uh, Instagram um, one of my favorite um, uh, foundation paper piecing uh, a style of quilting um, designers, Edith and Co. I found her on Instagram and now I order all of their patterns because they do a lot of the anatomy. That's where the heart and lungs and things that I do came from. So um, uh, social media can be a huge influence. When I see something I like, I make it. And then um, a lot of times it'll come from the person who the, the quilt is going to. How, what, what role does social media play in your life? Because you're not only on Instagram, you're also huge on TikTok. It was like, I saw one video of his like 300 something thousand views, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've uh, started TikTok uh, uh, within the last year um, as kind of a, a, another just fun outlet to try and relieve stress from my day work as a nurse practitioner because I would work I, on the front lines of COVID and it became very stressful. So um, social media at the beginning was just kind of a fun way to let some of that stress off as well as show some of my work and then uh, things just kind of blew up from there so at the beginning the role of social media was oh I posted a cute picture every once in a while for my family to look at um, but then the general public seemed to really like the work and, and now social media seems to take up a little bit uh, more of my life and time but it, honestly it's it's uh it's deepened my relationship with quilting um, because you do get that kind of positive feedback. You get that influence from other creators. You end up seeing more of what other people are doing. 
it's introduced me to more quilting artists than I knew that were out there. The number of other um, uh, uh, people who identify as males that are quilting um, has been amazing to find. So it's definitely a, a great way for me to have built a community. Some of my best friends now are um, people who I met on TikTok. Um, so that was cool. Um, and then it's just a great way to be able to, to get my work out there and, and share it with people. So it's, it's been a lot of fun. Do you have a stress over like, okay, what's what I'm going to post next? What reel I'm going to make next? Like, do you ever I do run out of ideas? <laughs> yeah, ideas uh, are a little hard to come by sometimes. Um, a lot of it is just, I try to keep it with things that are going to ring true to other quilters. So if I'm sitting around and I'm frustrated about a specific thing, I'll try and turn it around and make it funny and then make a video about it. And a lot of times it's just, how can I, in a cute, funny way that shows my personality, show my work? Um, so a lot of times my work influences what I'm going to post. Um, but a lot of times it's uh, true things that are happening in, in the quilting world. Um, but I try not to um, overthink what I'm posting. Um, I, the only thing I try to overthink about it is, or, and it's not even overthink, I try to give appropriate attention to is, Am I doing anything that's going to harm anybody? I don't want to put anything in my videos uh, unintentionally that is going to make someone feel uncomfortable, be a, a trigger, or uh, be um, harmful to any specific community. So I do sometimes run videos and things past friends for that reason. But as far as me looking silly or worried about the number of views, um, that is definitely... A, a thing that if you're on social media, you have to get past real fast because there's no way to control any of the algorithms and know what's going to do well and what's not going to. So I try to get past that. And if I want to post something, I try to keep it personal and post it and then just making sure that um, there's nothing harmful in the content. Do you feel like you've met people who you would like never ever meet otherwise in, in your life without the social media? Definitely. I mean, being able to meet people from other parts of the country and other parts of the world, I've met, uh, you know, like I said, some of my best friends are from the TikTok experience. So um, I definitely would have never met any of them. Um, uh, most of my recent projects that I've done, I've uh, started a kind of a series right before my move and I'll pick it up again when I get my sheens back and we're done with the move. I started kind of doing a series where I make uh, pillows for other creators. Um, and so those are just things that I would have never done those projects without social media. I would have never met those people without social media. So um, having the social media has not only kind of helped my process with quilting, but yeah, has introduced me to a ton of other people. And I think the thing that I love most, the thing that hits me the most and, and gets me that little bit of tearful is when I get messages from other people who I've never met, don't have their own social media or anything that say, I haven't quilted for 20 years, but I started again because I saw your video or I've never quilted in my life and I bought a quilt kit and I'm starting to do this because of your videos. And just knowing that um, especially when it's another minority quilter, whether it be a, a, a male in quilting or a LGBT or a bi person of color BIPOC, um, uh, to be able to kind of expand the community and start creating a larger inclusive community is the coolest thing ever. Right. You told me that you have four dogs and you also mentioned that some of the quilts that people give you to fix had met an unfortunate dog accident. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Has that ever like, happened to you to stuff that you're making? I'm afraid to say it, um, mm -hmm. knock on wood. Well, that's not true. I've never had any major damage to any finished quilts. So I do make the dogs their own simple quilts, which are just pieces of fabric that I quilt together. And so they have them kind of on the floor in the house. So those get torn up. And I think that's what saves some of my real quilts because <laughs> they have something else to chew on. Um, so luckily, knock on wood, I haven't had that happen. The worst that I've had happen is um, a, a small in project process uh, crochet project I had torn apart once. Um, and then um, while I was quilting a machine, uh, 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 quilt top on a, my long arm, 
my dog chewed the corner of just the the batting on the inside so didn't damage the quilt top and it was a super easy fix luckily um but other than that one amigurumi son um that I got chewed that up one. yeah the, yeah it was drew's pattern right <laughs> exactly drew me zoo yeah drew's pattern that's the only um project that has been really destroyed and that's because we recently got a puppy and that's what you get with puppies. So um, the three older dogs tend to, to not chew or touch anything. So now I just got to keep a puppy in check, which um, we made sure that I have good doors on my new quilting room and when we're we'll building the house. So hopefully those doors will help uh, keep her out. <laughs> Is there like ever a fabric that you don't like that, like how do you pick fabrics that you buy? Yeah, so, uh, there's kind of two types of fabrics that I buy. One is fabric for a specific project. So if I, um, like we were out today, we ate breakfast, my husband and I ate breakfast at Cracker Barrel. And if you've been to Cracker Barrel before, they have a section of quilts that they have for sale in the store. And they're all manufactured quilts. None of them are handmade by people, but they're still quilts and they're still beautiful. And there was a quilt there that they had, which is just strips of different blue fabrics. And then it, it's faked, but it looks like it's hand quilted together. And it was a beautiful quilt. And so he really liked that all blues. And so in the future, when I have a machine, I'm gonna go to Joanne's or my local quilt shop and I'll buy similar blue fabrics and, and I'll make something like that. Cause I know that it's something that he'll like. He likes everything to be same color and simple opposite of me. I like uh, everything <laughs> to be in my quilts. Um, so I'm, you know, that's one way that I'll go shopping or if I'm making a specific quilt for a specific person, like a child, I'll go get dinosaur fabric or things like that. Um, other ways that I do it is I just, there's certain fabrics that I get drawn to. So if I'm shopping around the store, um, I, I often tell people that um, uh, fabric collecting is a, a very valid hobby in its own and I definitely have my own collection that is aside from my quilts um so I have a very carefully curated collection of fabric I guess I'll say um so a lot of times it's just I really love the design I really love the colors and I have no idea what I'm going to do with it sometimes I'll even just stretch them over a canvas or put them inside of a embroidery hoop and, and just hang them on the wall and display them because they're beautiful. So um, yeah, I guess sometimes it's just things I'm drawn to and it's sometimes it's you know, a specific need for a specific project. Is there something that you bought and now you're looking back at it and you're like, what was I thinking? Oh, all the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I could go back through the fabrics that I bought when I first started quilting um, because I would go to discount fabric stores and you you just get overwhelmed with how cheap some of the fabric is. So you're like, oh, that's only a dollar to let me take all of it. And you get it home and you're like, well, what am I going to do with this now? And there's definitely some fabrics that I'm like, yeah, I should probably donate these because I don't think I'll ever, ever get to use them. But then as soon as you get rid of it, right, a project will come up that you're like, that would have been perfect for. So we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you could, like out of the whole quilt, right, if you could give some tasks to somebody else to do for you, what would it be? Binding. <laughs> I hate binding quilts um, and binding for those who aren't quilters is putting the outside on the, the finished quilt itself. Um, I, you know, you've done all the work with piecing the top together. You've done all the work with doing the actual quilting of combining the three layers and then you get done and you just want this quilt to be finished and you have to do that final tedious step. And it's very detailed work to get right. It's you're working with a very thin strip of fabric. You have to tightly wrap it around. And then the traditional way to do it is to hand sew it onto the back. And most quilts that I do, I'm doing a lot of hand sewing now um, because I don't have my machines while we travel. Um, but uh, traditionally I do everything on a machine. So machine quilting goes a lot faster. And so you get done with this long project and then you have to slow down and do this tedious method of hand quilting. And so that's the piece that bothers me the most. And then it, there are ways to do it with machine, but it doesn't hide the, the seam for you. It doesn't hide the thread like the hand piecing does and give it as quite as nice of a look. So generally I will machine 
uh, bind because I hate doing it. But if it's a, a very important gift or something that is going to be more of an heirloom quilt, I will make sure I, I hand sew that on. But if I could, if I could get somebody else to do that for me, I definitely would. <laughs> right. Well, what's in your heirloom collection? Like what quilts will you never give away? I have a, um, a, a quilt that I made with uh, the Mr. Domestic's Aurora line of fabric, which is a line of fabric that he was inspired to make when he went on a trip to Hawaii with his daughter. I lived in Hawaii for seven years. So as soon as I saw that line of fabric, I knew that I wanted to make a quilt with it to commemorate my time in Hawaii. So um, to take it a step further, I used a traditional quilt block called a pineapple block. Um, and made it using this uh, Hawaii-inspired fabric. So that is one quilt that I will um, never give up. Another one of my favorite favorite designers, his name is Juicy Juice, he's a fabric designer. And I created this quilt that is um, very fine piecing. And so the strips of fabric are just less than like a quarter of an inch across. And it's just hundreds of tiny little pieces of fabric in every small little space. And it took me just hours upon hours to make. And I absolutely love the kind of uh, 70s, 80s color vibe that it gives. And uh, so a lot of times it's, it's connected to something that I've done. I made a quilt for a specific reason and that's a quilt that I'm gonna hold on to forever. Um, the quilt that I made my mother with the Cardinals, I definitely consider an heirloom quilt and took the time to do everything perfectly because it's a, a meaningful family gift that's gonna last forever. Um, so. And then sometimes it's just, I love the fabric that much or I love the design that much and, and the amount of time that I put into it, I, I'm never gonna wanna lose it. So those are some of the things. Right, well, you mentioned that you also crochet, like is, do you see yourself doing different fiber arts like a year from now and going all the way into that? Or do you think you're gonna always be a quilter? I think quilting will always be my, my thing. Um, I just have a, a love and passion for it. And for me, quilting is my art. Um, when I do other, other arts or other crafts, for me, those are more of hobbies. So I love crochet, but it's definitely, I'm not at the level where I, I feel like what I'm making is my art. Uh, it's more of a fun craft for me to where quilting is truly my, my art, my medium. Um, I do want to get into other things like uh, embroidery, um, you know, needlework that I can also incorporate into a quilt. And I think there's going to be some fun ways in the future that I'm going to incorporate even crochet work uh, into a quilt. So I definitely want to explore even more of the fiber arts and kind of uh, find out how I can work those into what I do. Um, but quilting is always going to be my medium. So if you meet a new person, do you like think of yourself to introduce yourself as a um, doctor or you a quilter? Like, where do you see yourself first? Like, what comes to mind? Yeah, if you would have asked me that question three months ago, I definitely would have said uh, nurse practitioner, doctor of nursing practice was the, the main thing, right? I, Hi, I'm John, and then this is what I do. Um, the past couple months and, and taking this kind of cross country journey and taking time off and, and spending a lot of time uh, hand quilting and piecing, I think I now would place quilting higher. Um, and I definitely have noticed that that comes up way more in conversation now than my career of being a nurse practitioner. So um, that that is an interesting question because that's starting to turn in my life right now. Um, but I definitely hold being a quilter to uh, just as high, if not a higher level. Um, and I think I'm doing some things that are just as important um, in the world through my quilting right now as I do with my uh, practice as a nurse practitioner. Do you have a dream? Like what's your dream in regards to quilting? Like forget about money making, forget about time consuming things. Like if nothing was, stopping you like what would you do uh if I could I would do kind of full-time art quilting um to uh promote uh minority inclusivity into quilting if I could spend 100% of my time 
um, making the quilting world a better place for all individuals um, who want to be uh, supportive of the whole community. That's what I would do. And, and I think a lot of my quilting in the future is going to continue to lean more in that direction. Um, and so that would be my thing. And, and right now I've kind of started that by trying to promote charities as much as possible and, and kind of get that ball rolling. Um, I definitely, because of my professional career, don't need to have any income from quilting. Um, so that's a definite uh, uh, benefit. Um, and so, yeah, if, if, if I could, it would be to be able to spend 100% of my time focusing on uh, quilting as an art and how to um, make this community uh, much more inclusive. When you tell other people, not quilters, like just random people on the street or like some of your patients that you are a quilter, what's the reaction? Like are people amazed that you're a quilter? Do they yeah, want to are... more? Like how do they... Yeah, people are generally surprised, genuinely surprised most of the time, as uh, uh, especially a, a doctor of nursing practice coming in and, and saying, I'm a quilter, right? I'm a, a professional that in, in the world is generally held at a very high regard, right? So then coming in and, and kind of throws them off as a male and a professional at that level of one, they think, where do you have the time to do it, right? But we all have time if we make time for things. Um, and then the other part is just, I don't think people are used to males saying I'm involved in something that is a fiber art. So I definitely get the surprise. When I first started telling people, I was always nervous that I was going to get some sort of like judgment or uh, negative comments. And, and that very, very rarely ever happens. It's generally people want to know a lot more about what I do. And generally they end up asking if they can purchase something or if I can make something for them. Um, and especially I, as a nurse practitioner, I'm a geriatric specialty. So my patients are, are uh, generally 70 years of age or older. Um, and a lot of times, uh, you know, and then the majority of that population that is age is women. Right. And so that's a generation where quilting is a, a big thing for them generally or even if it wasn't a big thing for them it was a big part of the how they grew up it was just around so they generally have a lot stronger connection to quilting and it's uh, opened up a lot of connections with me with my patients where it gets them to uh, respect me more and trust me more because it it opens up a conversation outside of uh, medicine where we can uh, talk and we can connect and, and develop that trusting relationship. If you were to rate yourself like from zero to 10 on the expert level of quilting, where do you see yourself right now? Oh man, I'm just kind of <laughs> scratching the surface. Um, I would say probably a three. Um, and, and that's a tricky question too, because I'm really good at what I do, right? But I do a very small amount of what there is in quilting. My materials have been very limited such far. Um, I do very limited styles of quilting. I've just started doing English paper piecing. Traditionally, I do just traditional piecing and foundation paper piecing. And there's so many other methods out there. I, I, when I get my machine back, one of the first things I want to try doing is portrait quilting, um, is my kind of next mission to learn how to do. Um, so overall, I would say I'm probably at a three out of 10, but when it comes to specific techniques, I would rate myself maybe an eight or nine out of 10 on some specific techniques or things that I do. So yeah, I think I'm really good at what I do, but um, knowing how much there is out there, I know nothing about quilting yet. So, <laughs> Well, do you ever feel like the, the imposter syndrome when you like hear people thinking here I am saying I'm quilting doctor people know me on Instagram people know me on TikTok and yet I'm at three like do you get that insecurity about like your level of expertise ever I used to um but I think the the mentality that I've had to have in my professional world as a nurse practitioner um, when you practice as a doctor, you, you have to have a level of confidence in knowing what you're doing, right? It's a life or death situation most of the time, even when you're prescribing sometimes safe medications. If you do it wrong, it can be very dangerous. Right. Um, so having developed that kind of confidence, confidence in my professional life, I think has helped me learn how to develop that confidence in my quilting life. 
Um, and so that I have an understanding of I know what I know and I know that what I do know is good. Um, so that has helped. But definitely, I mean, I get asked to go into worlds where there's people who have quilted for 30 years and they're asking me to teach, um, which is a situation that just blows my mind that somebody with that kind of experience would ask me to show them how to do something. So that definitely throws you back into that kind of imposter syndrome. I've been quilting for four years. I do very limited things, but people still want to know how I do things because of the products that I produce. Um, so it definitely, sometimes I, I just have to take a step back and, and recognize, look at what I have done. Uh, you need to take pride and confidence in that um, with having a respect for the things that you don't know and understanding that the larger community out there knows a world of things that I may never know. So I think it goes back to having that respect for what the quilting community was before I got there. Um, and uh, just as long as you maintain that respect for it, it allows you to maintain that respect for yourself and what you do. And so it's finding the balance of both worlds. But I mean, I still in my professional life sometimes feel an imposter syndrome and it, it definitely holds true to the quilting world as well sometimes but i also find that long time experience does not necessarily translate into expertise because you can have like i mean i met some people who like all their life they knitters they learn to knit as children and all life they knitted hats and socks and they have no idea about anything else and they're like well i want to try lace but i never touched lace and i find sometimes you can be an ambitious young knitter or ambitious young crafter and you can go into more depth in certain things than people who like very comfortably have been doing certain things for all their lives. Yeah, that's definitely, definitely true and definitely true in the, the quilting world as well is if you learn one thing from your grandma 40 years ago and that's the only way you do it and the only thing you do, your skills are never going to grow, right? So I'm the person who's getting kind of resources from everywhere and trying to learn a little bit from everything. And if I see somebody sewing in a different way than I sew, I want to go and see what they're doing and decide, is that a way that I want to do it too, right? And mix that into what I do. So definitely you got to keep that, that openness to grow and to learn and never stop learning. I always relate that kind of concept to doctors as well. You get doctors that were trained 40 years ago that still treat the condition the same way they did 40 years ago, even though that's not how you're supposed to do it anymore, right? But they are never gonna change because that's how they were taught. That's what they've always done. That's what they're gonna keep doing. So staying kind of up to date with new things, learning old things, understanding what works for you and what doesn't and, and never stop learning is definitely a must in any art. Well, are you like, would you call yourself an ambitious quilter? I'm definitely an ambitious quilter. Uh, I think I'm an ambitious crafter in general too. And um, I, I drew from Derby Zoo always makes fun of me that I always start with the most difficult projects, right? If I want to do something, I'm not going to uh, practice it and do a baby version of it. Like I just go in. Um, and if I mess it up, great. I'll, I'll do it again. And then you learn from it. So I definitely will dive in things that at the time are way over my head. Um, but the results, you know, if you put the time and effort in, can turn out just as good as somebody who's been doing it for multiple years, uh, like you said. So I, I, I would say I'm an overambitious quilter, actually. <laughs> well, when you look at that first quilt with the red cardinals that you made yeah. for your mom, like, what do you see? Like, if you look at it now, like, what jumps at you? Um, so the, the thing about that quilt that amazes me the most about that that came from me is there was there was no pattern. Um, there was no pre-design to it. I purchased fabrics that I thought were going to look really well together. I made up the design as I went. I took my scraps that I had and made more parts of it. Like the stars in the corners didn't come till the very end. And I just kind of used the scraps. So the amount of different... Um, styles that are used in that quilt, um, the different techniques, uh, the lack of a pattern. Um, I just, it blows my mind that that's the first quilt that I made by myself because 
Um, that's a quilt that I think a lot of people who have been quilting for years would be very proud to have made. Um, so yeah, it's uh, still I'm one of the things I'm the most proud of and, and just baffles me that as a as a true beginner first quilt, I just jumped into something that I had no idea what I was doing and, and it, it worked. <laughs> Did you have any difficulties with that machine, like learning how to sew? Um, I think learning how to use a sewing machine was the hardest part. Um, uh, and every machine is a little bit different, right? So the machine I learned on with my friend was slightly different than the machine that I had purchased, the brother machine I'd purchased at Costco. Um, but luckily that specific machine that I bought is just a power horse. I never had any actual like mechanical problems with it. And still to this day, it's my backup machine and I can pull it out of the closet and it like works perfectly. <laughs> so luckily it was just a really good machine. But I think the biggest learning curve was just learning the actual skills needed to, to run the machine, right? Because I just wanted to get going in quilts and you have to take a minute and, and really understand how the tools work before you jump into it. But um, the, uh, the other problem was that it was a small machine and that was a very large quilt. And so um, quilting something that big on a machine that small is very difficult often to get the quilt to go through it because there's just not the space. So those were, that was probably the biggest challenge was that machine was probably not made to do a project of that size. Right. Well, I want to ask you something just because you're in the medical uh, profession. Do you have any tips, advice as to how to keep yourself from getting stiff and like being in pain and your fingers cramming and all that good stuff that happens to all of us crafters? Definitely. So obviously good posture, good ergonomics. Um, make sure that, and I'm not doing it now because I'm sitting in a bed in an RV, but right, making sure that your back has the appropriate curve to it. Make sure that your machine is at the right level so that your, your arms are comfortable going through and you're not going to create any tension. Um, you'll know it when you feel the tension, right? If, you're, if that, a part of your body is starting to get sore from repetitiveness, you need to change something with what you're doing. And there are all kinds of adaptive tools out there. Um, one thing with like, I, I can give a specific example with English paper piecing is you spend a lot of time pinching fabrics together so that you can sew them together. And a lot of times people will end up having uh, tendon or pains through their hands um, because of that type of pinching. So I'll tell people, get some clips or get some magnets to hold that together to relieve that pinching tension. So if there's anything you're doing where you're putting a lot of pressure onto something or a lot of repetitiveness and getting sore in a certain area, find a tool that relieves that pressure, right? If you're, if you're squeezing hard, what can squeeze hard for you? Um, if your back is hurting, your neck is hurting, how can you lower or raise your chair or get a lumbar support for your back? So um, it's hard to give specifics because there's so many different things, but if your body is feeling sore, stop and adjust things so that it's not feeling sore anymore. And don't wait until it hurts, right? right? You know when it's starting to feel tired and that's when you have the beginning of a problem. So don't wait till it gets too further. Stop when things start getting tired. Do you have any bad habits? <laughs> Posture is probably the biggest one for me, actually. Um, I, I, I am not good at taking the own advice that I just gave. I um, like to be a minimalist a lot of times when I'm doing things. So like, even though I know I should be using magnets or clips, I don't want to carry them around with me. So I don't, um, I don't often adjust my chair when I need it. I'll stand up in quilts, which can be really awful. So my worst habit is probably just taking the advice that I gave you. <laughs> So when you um, quilt, how long do you quilt at the time? Like talking about how you find time for that, like how much time are they talking about? Yeah, I mean, it can depend. Sometimes it'll be uh, snagging 30 minutes at the end of a long day. Um, if I've got a weekend, sometimes it's a 10 hour day in the uh, sewing room. Um, I've definitely quilted, I think, a lot more. Uh, over the past couple of years because of COVID and uh, you know when you're stuck at home and you can't 
go out and meet with friends. Quilting is a great thing to be able to do by yourself or jump on a, a video conference call with some friends and, and craft together. So that's been a major way that I've built up time. And then my spouse being in the military, he travels a lot. So there's a lot of times when it's just me at the house with four dogs, which means I've got to be home a lot. And so a lot of time being able to get into the quilting room, but um, it's definitely kind of difficult managing, you know, a time for any activity outside of professional employment when you work full time. And so I've also set up boundaries for myself with work where, you know, I'm going to work the amount of time that I'm paid for um, and I don't take it home anymore. It's just something that I won't do. And so I know when I go home that that's my time and then I build in time for quilting. So um, if I want to get something done and I will set aside, you know, time after dinner from six to eight o'clock to be in my quilting room and my partner knows that that's my time in my quilting room and not to bother me with anything else. So the biggest thing I think is, is I've been able to kind of set those boundaries in my professional and my personal life to say, this time is for me. I need this to de-stress. And, and that's the most important thing at that time. Well, talking about distressing, do you ever get stressed from quilting? <laughs> yeah, every time I have to rip out a seam. And you probably saw the TikTok video about that <laughs> as well. Um, yeah, I mean, quilting, you know, anytime you're doing an art and things don't go the way that you want to do it, it can be very stressful. And so what I do, try to do is is make light of it and, and make it a funny situation and make it a joke, right? Because um, the reason I'm quilting is to de-stress. And then, like you said, there's things that can really get to you. So um, you got to kind of just sometimes take a step back and, and laugh at yourself. And I think that's often the best medicine. <laughs> How is your spouse reacting to your um, crafting, accumulation of crafting supplies? <laughs> Um, I, I think he recognizes we need more space. Um, he loves it though, to be honest, loves the, uh, kind of seeing how happy it makes me, um, loves the things that we make, uh, or that I make, um, you know, I've made gifts for his family, for, um, his mother, my mother-in-law. So, um, it definitely, I think is becoming a special part of the family that we're building, um, and uh, we are both, uh, you know, full-time workers. He's military. I'm a nurse practitioner. So um, we're in a, a place where we're in a, a pretty lucky place that not a lot of people are able to be where we have, I have the ability to, to spend money and things when I want to. So um, that doesn't become a hardship for us at all because we both have our own incomes and, and it's not an issue. So luckily, because of a little bit of privilege and the and just him being a, a very amazing, supportive person. Um, it's always, he's been my um, biggest cheerleader with it, really. Right. Well, talking about support, how can my viewers support you? So I think the, the biggest things you can do to support me is just kind of follow along, join along with the, you know, my Instagram journey, my TikTok, TikTok journey. Um, uh, I'll be, um, launching, uh, before this airs, launching a website. Um, and, uh, my biggest goal is to, um, support other communities, make quilting a more inclusive place. Right now I'm, um, supporting a charity called One Common Thread. Um, so if you check out my stuff, you'll see everything that I'm pushing to those charities to onecommonthread.org right now. So the biggest way that you can support me is, is follow along and support the groups that I'm, I'm pushing and promoting. Um, or just, you know, stop by, like a video, say hi, um, let me know that you're, you know, you're enjoying it. If it's influenced in you in any way, uh, let me know. Um, but the biggest thing is become a part of the community and remain inclusive. And, and those are the biggest ways that you can support me. Right. Well, we'll put all the links to you, to your Instagram, TikTok, and everything else on the website under this video. So you guys Perfect. can find John and follow him and say hi. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, John, for being my, my guest today. I really love talking to you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.